Hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Cancer Patient Lab. And today we're pleased to have Vanessa Liu with us to talk about CareBud, the work that she's doing to develop a uh, chatbot-based app for helping cancer patients. Um, but before we get going with Vanessa, I wanted to uh, uh, in, you know, say, <laughs> inform you all, most of you know this routine, but uh, our two standard disclaimers. The first is that this is just information for education, for helping people, for helping you uh, with uh, your uh, medical care, which you should only get through a professional medical team. So you can use this as information to take to your medical team, but this is not medical advice. And the second is that uh, this will be made public. So uh, if you're concerned about having your image, your name, or anything, uh, we will make everything that go goes here public. So you can turn off your camera if you're concerned about your image, or you can uh, change your name, and you cannot say anything. And that way you can remain anonymous throughout the session. Um, Vanessa, uh, I, I'll now, now to introduce Vanessa and care about, I got to know Vanessa through Roger Royce, who's not on today. Roger Royce is a leader in our pancreatic cancer lab. He's a, a lawyer in Silicon Valley, so he's in touch with a lot of uh, startups and um, uh, new ventures in, uh, in coming out of Silicon Valley tech uh, new ventures. And uh, he introduced me to Vanessa. And uh, I, and I think everyone at Cancer Patient Lab is very supportive of any startups. I think startups are the way to disrupt the status quo. And so immediately anything we can do to help. And so uh, Vanessa uh, was kind enough to meet with us and, and uh, to share what she's up to. And also uh, one of the things that I say to startups is that we have here in Cancer Patient Lab, kind of a ready-made focus group to give guidance and feedback. So as a startup is developing its software, um, we're happy to give them feedback on what's valuable and less valuable to us as cancer patients. Um, so that's uh, the background. So uh, Vanessa basically has license to use this hour together with us and then whatever helps advance her approach. And I think she'll be asking for those who are willing to um, participate in some user experience. I did it last night. Um, I worked with Vanessa and her colleague Eileen and went through some of the initial uh, iterations they have of their, their software and gave them feedback on what I thought uh, some ideas for making it better. And she'll be asking all of you to do the same. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Vanessa. I think as usual, the format will be, she'll do some introductory with maybe a few slides to tell you about CareBud and then open it up for the kind of focused questions and I'll let her guide the kinds of questions that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. And um, thank you everyone for joining this call. It's a huge pleasure to be here um, as a caregiver myself. And um, I know how hard it is to go through the treatment. And I know most of you are still probably in the stage going through treatments or doing maintenance. Um, and you probably also work full time. So I really appreciate the effort and time. Um, I feel like sometimes like just by saying thank you is not enough to express my, my appreciation. But um, here, I just want to let you know, I really, really appreciate like you gave your time and effort. Um, and let me maybe share my screen. Um, I have some slides um, to introduce CareBud. So before I dive into those, uh, let me quickly put up. Let me know if you can see my screen. It's all good. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so maybe just give you a little background about me first. Um, I was a caregiver to my husband who was um, diagnosed with T-cell ALL back in 2018 when he was just a 
uh, 29. Uh, it was a shocking news. Uh, we did our first round treatment at Stanford. Um, stem cell transplant plus uh, chemo. He reached remission and uh, then for the, next, uh, for the next three years, we were doing maintenance treatment on, until he relapsed again. Um, and to that point, at that point, we were told our best option may be just to seek um, more advanced treatment. So we participated in a clinical trial at MD Anderson. It was a really tough several years, including the first uh, treatment at Stanford. He had a lot of reactions and side effects because of our experience and also what we witnessed um, through the treatment, we just feel there's a lot of room for improvement, especially when it comes to patient side. Oftentimes we were waiting to hear back from doctors about um, what could be the trigger for some of his specific reactions. Are those, we were like always wondering our head, are those side effects or are those infection? And um, also we knew there are a lot of like information resources out there, but we were so tired, got to a point like we have to uh, really make the best use of the time. Are we, are we willing to use the time to just like chill, to really enjoy a cup of, a sip of coffee or are we, are we really want to do another round of research? Um, because the good time is so little. Uh, he's tired all, all the time. Um, yeah, so this kind of like the origin of the idea. Um, at CareBud, what we like to do is um, we like to come up with a tool that can be truly pa patient-centric. Um, nowadays, we know AI chatbot has been there. So why don't we utilize the AI chatbot and create this tool that can provide comprehensive and also personalized information to patients and caregivers. So can lighten up the, losing the, um, the burden in terms of like information scraping. Um, this is kind of our vision for MVP. And down the road, we'd also like to utilize this AI chatbot interface to make it like a personal cancer patient, personal assistant. So the chatbot can proactively lead patient to the useful resources and proactively remind um, patients about their medication, their care key engagement. So let the chatbot do the heavy lift. You don't need to really think in my in your head what I need to do next because the chatbot can actually lead you. Um, this is kind of our vision. Um, so solution, as I mentioned, we, we want to feature these four perspectives, comprehensive, personalized, proactive, and simple. As, as a patient, I think the least thing you want to do is to spend a few hours to, to get over the learning curve, to learn a new um, tool. And once you register and you figure out the interface, it's so hard to navigate and it takes another few hours or days to get used to it. So I think this kind of like our vision, uh, we want it to be very simple. Um, just like you're talking to someone in like a simple language. Um, we prepared a few user cases and this is one actually I utilized- Any, uh, headphones from the garage? Yes, it oh. actually- I utilize the John is a uh, is a is a fake name. Uh, basically, I used I looked at um, the patient discussion um, forum in Cancer Patient Lab, 
you have tons of really detailed, useful, personalized information talking about symptoms, treatments. I think this can benefit a lot of patients out there who don't know about cancer patient lab, but who are experiencing similar symptoms. So what we like to do is um, we like to kind of uh, build a knowledge database utilizing those this detailed discussions and can lead patient to look at those discussions and get familiar with uh, what other people or just get some knowledge about what other patients are experiencing. What are the options out there? A lot of people, I think, this group is very unique. You all have a lot of knowledge um, come from either like in the same industry or you are very experienced, you know how to do the research. But to be honest, I think a lot of patients out there, they don't know these resources and they, they need guidance when it comes to do research. Um, so I think the, the main point here is the chatbot can leads the patient to a lot of useful resources, not just comprehensive high level, but um, more personalized. And also can create this patient community. They know there's a forum out there. They know there are other patient fellow out there who are experiencing same one, so they're not alone. And this one is more for like a newly diagnosed cancer patient um, who don't know where to start. And then the chatbot can provide a sense of um, all the uh, more credit resources out there. So the patients can trust the resource. Uh, a lot of the resources are like clinicaltrial.gov or American Cancer Society. They have this, they have their own database um, and we, would like to basically guide patients and caregivers to those um, credit uh, information resources so they can start like prep themselves. And also patients don't know what questions they should ask doctors, what direction they should go. And this is a good way to kind of also prepare the patient to, to, um, to know what can happen later on and also to prepare them for uh, their meetings with doctors or their, their uh, going forward their engagement with their caregivers or their family. Um, I only have these two, but this, these two are among many user cases and other user cases could be um, just pure high level, like ask about financial resource, so um, like um, mental resource, uh, or ask about um, uh, uh, lifestyle, health tapes, and other use cases you can think of it as what, while the uh, patients are doing maintenance kind of already cancer free, and they want to just like do a few checkups on their symptoms, um, the chatbot can also answer the question. Um, so yeah, so for now, these are kind of like the, the vision for our um, MVP. And our MVP will be very focused on providing um, treatment and medical related, but definitely we don't want to step into giving um, medical advice. So we're still building the MVP and later on, we're gonna engage oncologists to, to score our answers, to score the chatbot answers. And so we know for sure the answers we provide um, is good, is solid, but at the same time, won't make us into this risky area by giving too much or leading the patient to have this like miss conception about um, they can utilize our chatbot to replace doctors. These are the areas we for sure um, uh, gonna test and gonna avoid. Um, yeah, this pretty much it is. Uh, let me know if you have any um, comments or questions.
Okay, mm -hmm. so th this is where we get into the discussion part and the way we typically run this, maybe uh, Vanessa, if you could turn off the screen share and mm -hmm. then we will um, use the raise hand feature for people who have questions or comments on what Vanessa has uh, presented. And Vanessa, also feel free, you know, if you have particular questions about, you know, directions you could emphasize or not emphasize, for example, um, feel free to ask those questions too. But first off the top, does anybody have any questions? Um, again, using the, the raise hand feature, questions or comments. There we go, there's, there's Eric, uh, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Vanessa, thank you for uh, demoing that. It looks interesting. My my questions are what data set are you pulling from and like like how encompassing is a system prompt or, or is it just some kind of large language model that you're pulling from? Um, good question. And for MVP, we want to be uh, we want to act fast. So we are utilizing uh, Assistant API, Chatbot uh, GPT-4 as the base model. And then we layer in uh, additional knowledge, including um, discussions um, hosted at Cancer Patient Lab, which um, Brad and I, we already talked about it. Um, and we also prioritize we train the chatbot to kind of give a hierarchy about the knowledge they should look into first. So uh, in terms of hierarchy, we rank um, database, the fact-based fact -based database first, like clinicaltrial.gov, daily math. Um, those gonna be uh, more hierarchy than the baseline model itself. And then the second layer gonna be like information discussed uh, um, within those reputable patient advocacy groups. Um, the only one we're gonna do, or we're probably gonna partner with another um, uh, uh, advocacy group, but it's still in discussion. But the one we're gonna utilize for our IVP is Cancer Patient Labs information. So we have kind of several layers, but the base model is GPT-4 um, through Assistant API. Okay. Um, so, so I understand MVP. Um, I'm a software product manager myself. Um, so what, what does your, your roadmap look like after an MVP in terms of like where you might go with enhancements or something after that? Uh, great question. So for now, our goal is to kind of get user traction, but also at the same time, utilizing MVP as a tool to kind of um, see how uh, users like react to it. Okay. And some user um, reaction and to kind of iterate our MVP and also utilize it as a tool to um, kind of like uh, let people get used to chatbot. Not a lot of, it's still a new technology. I don't think a lot of people feel comfortable using it. Um, later on, we have this survey designed to uh, gather people's patient thoughts on the features they want to see and how comfortable they're using uh, chatbot. And later on after the call, I'm gonna uh, I do have a favor to ask if you can maybe fill in the survey, um, provide your thoughts, that would be very helpful. But um, at the same time, our MVP is kind of the tool to help us to understand um, where sure. we can improve and okay. also to, to also teach the users, yeah. make them feel more and more comfortable using it. Makes sense. All right, I, I have a couple of questions that are in chat, but I'll uh, I'll let the other people have a voice to ask those questions. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Eric and and um, Vanessa. You should, uh, as Eric said, he's both a patient survivor and as well a software product manager. So he's somebody you're really going to want to take advantage of because um, he's got that good combination. <clears throat> 
Um, and I just, just as uh, Vanessa, just a little bit, um, there are a few terms that we're throwing around. I assume everybody knows, but you might, you might explain MVP and, you know, open AI, chat bots, chat GPT, and these sorts of things. If you could just do a uh, basic introduction to those two, two ideas, which are, I think, assumed by everyone here, but maybe just to, you know, ground us. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so MVP stands for minimum viable product. Is basically uh, you can think it as a simpler, like a very simple version of your product. It just have one or two features you want to let your users test first to utilize first, and it's a tool for you for normally for uh, startups to gain user traction and to show um, to kind of have have a proof of concept this your business um, can, can actually work. This business idea can actually work. And uh, GPT is a, a chatbot model um, designed, developed by OpenAI. Um, so we are, um, for um, MVP, we are utilizing their latest model version, which is GPT-4. Um, and also I think I mentioned Assistant API. Assistant API is um, an interface um, for developers. So it's part of, uh, it's basically the same GPT for the chatbot, but you can think it as GPT four is for front end users like us, which is just want to type in some questions and um, or give some instructions, then the chatbot can provide information. Assistant API is the same thing, but it's the it's a backend. It's designed for developer to code to build the app. Uh, so it's more it's more customizable, and it can also um, help you to connect with other um, softwares. You can do other uh, more advanced, uh, build more advanced uh, um, features within Assistant API. Uh, yeah, hopefully I answered this question. Well. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make sure everybody was on a on a you know level playing field to start. Um, next up is Alan Masella. Um, the, as you can see in his nice background, the Masella Foundation and an expert uh, MD and uh, expert no, on I, brain I'm cancer. Not an MD, I'm a DPM. Oh, there we go. Anyway, uh, my organization is partnering with Cancer Commons, another nonprofit, to create a chatbot for basically the same type of thing. We'd love to try to work together so we we'll talk offline later. Uh, but what is your business model? Like, um, how is this going to fund itself? Uh, yes. So um, for business model, we're gonna design it to be uh, multifaceted, multiple revenue streams coming from both um, consumers and also institutions. So we're gonna be both B2B and B2C. Um, we have to test the idea. For B2C part, it's gonna be subscription-based um, for like advanced features, but it's not gonna be uh, implemented along together with MVP. So it's gonna be future features if they want to utilize more advanced features, um, not just a language model, not just a chatbot, then consumers, patients need to pay a subscription fee. And for B2B, we're thinking about partnering with life science companies. Um, basically we can, co-host the campaigns, educational ca campaigns together. And we can also, um, I think it's, it's, the benefit is, um, is mutual. We gonna, um, we want to let people, users know there are those very advanced treatments out there. Um, so we're gonna lead patients, we're gonna make patients aware of those resources at the same time, um, the life science companies can reach to the potential users. So there's a mutual benefit. And also we're gonna run um, some uh, education campaigns. Um, so this is one part of the B2B. Another will be kind of like a, a, a fundraising from uh, 
patient advocacy groups um, to utilize resource, uh, monetary resource, resource or non-monetary resource by partnering together, um, kind of like a similar format as, um, as this scenario demonstrated. Um, we utilize the data. Also at the same time, we introduce users to look at those um, patient advocacy groups forums. Um, so both parties can like reach each other more easily. Yeah, it gets sticky though when uh, like if a drug manufacturer sponsors it, then that <laughs> might bias the chatbot to their drug, which is something we've been grappling with. Uh, it's tough. You need money to make it run, but it's hard. So we're thinking more along the lines of uh, charity has like a wall between the funding and the projects. So have the charities fund the chatbot and not even tell you who's funding it. So make sure that it's completely unbiased. It's tough. Yeah. It's, it's, a tough it's a very tough thing. I understand, you know, we need money to make it run. Um, but it's a it's a great idea. I think that you two, again, Vanessa, Al's another person you're going to want to have a follow-up conversation with to go into this because he's clearly thought about it. I think yeah, I maybe. mentioned to you before that um, uh, I worked with Rabble Health and they came up with a similar model where a patient advocacy group establish the relationships with the patients and then they provided infrastructure for that patient advocacy group so it's again it's kind of a hybrid model like Al's saying where the nonprofit charity-based philanthropic organization is, is uh, kind of the front and then they were providing infrastructure behind the scenes to that that charity that was up front so it's it's a way to finesse it so it doesn't look you're not seeing it as you know uh, the the, the app vendor or uh, being the one who's promoting. They're right. kind of, they're, they're, great, they've uh, white labeled. We have some great resources. Like we have a patient registry that has about 120,000 patients in it with like all the medical information that the chat back can learn from, you know, what treatments they're doing, the outcomes. Um, we have virtual tour boards where um, probably ChatGPT could listen in or hear a recording and figure out the rationales of why these doctors are recommending different things. Um, a lot of good stuff in there. That yeah. has a lot of potential. Sorry. That's what we've talked about also with Vanessa, is that these conversations, literally these conversations we're having right now where patients are having a conversation with experts can become uh, the, 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 the uh, body of knowledge that the chat bot is looking at. So. Uh, all of the tumor board conversations become an asset. So all that's data that can you can feed into the the chat box. So these are these are great ideas. Right. But as a question in the chat says, we have to deal with misinformation, which is scary because if you look at the internet, even clinicaltrials.gov has a lot of bad trials on it. Um, you can't trust clinicaltrials.gov. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah, so so the, the, let me use that as a segue to Bob Shah, who's who's yeah, up next, and that he he. He raised, he raised the comment about uh, misinformation. So go ahead, Bapcha. Well, let me start with LLM is a large language model, which is what chat GPT is. Uh, the way they get their data is by scrubbing all kinds of public sources. With As it stands today, there are no filters. So um, going forward, um, when not at the MVP level, but when it's actually rolled out to patients, um, I can work with you, Vanessa, on how to deal with misinformation because uh, uh, like I shared with uh, Brad up front, um, so Brad, sorry if I got your name wrong. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, I've, I've run a Facebook group for like over 15 years. It's one of very few properly science-based, anti-scammer, anti, you know, scam group online. And that's where I met Vanessa. Uh, I had late stage Hodgkin's lymphoma, but that was in 1995, 96. 
So I have been in remission for a long time. So I've been lucky to be in remission because I was treated at Stanford. So anyway, that being said, uh, yeah, we need to deal with misinformation, scams, and then stuff like, you know, as soon as you're diagnosed with cancer, a whole bunch of idiots descend on you. Pardon me for using the word idiots, but that's what, that's what they are. Could be family members, friends, and they all mean well, except they will give you bad information, like dandelion root cures cancer, or, you know, I have this wonderful magical water that's going to cure all cancers, you know, any cancers, which is a red flag in itself. So, um, Anyway, sorry, I, I'm bloviating here, so thanks. Any um, plans on, I, I can help you with that, Nessa. Thanks. What, what have you seen, I guess, would be the question, Babcha, on uh, how you can filter for misinformation and scammers. You, it sounds like you're doing it manually. You're doing it with humans, and that would be a big job, I guess. Well, if you can do it manually, it's, it's easy to automate it. Um, you need hmm. to tell the okay. large language model what you're doing, and that's how LLMs work. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Any other questions or comments on you know misinformation and filtering that out for Vanessa? What is L L M S? Large language model system. So it's generative AI. It's just this late, it's all like, it's different names for generative AI. This is sort of this latest wave of AI with chat GPT, open AI, BARD is Google's product. Mm -hmm. um, and what's, what Vanessa is alluding to is these are general purpose tools that, um, you know, will have literally a billion customers. And what they need to do is be customized for different use cases and applications in, in specific areas, whether it's healthcare, cancer or maybe you know a specific kind of cancer like a prostate cancer so the work that has to be done is companies like Vanessa's need to take this down to a level where it's actually useful to patients and it's not just a general purpose model where you're asking general questions but more of a, a medical uh, working in the medical zone for a customized uh, uh, service I think maybe I can make a comment on that um sorry my voice is a little <coughs> off right now but um, I mean, there, there are a ton of companies in this space, when it says, prob you probably know, right? And everybody is trying to do a piece of slice. What are they good at? Where can they add value in this? So, so there are companies who are going to be the data aggregators for LLM training, who have anonymized data, taking it across, not just for chat GPT, uh, four dot orders, but across many, many different uh, sources, organizations, and stuff like that. And then there are companies that are gonna focus on the front end. What do I do with that stuff now? How do I sell this patient and some stuff? Because by itself, it's a very, very big task, right? Because if everybody starts from scratch, trying to clean the data, sanitize the data, and you know, label the data, figure it out. I mean, it's just, just a, so, so, so like every other software thing, it's a, layered, uh, you know, industry goes into the layered architecture of who's doing what and where. So so the question is, are there companies that are already leading in that space of getting you the data as best as they can? And they will be at that space. They are not the customer facing companies and you're the customer facing company, which is recognizing the landing zone of where your customers are, how you want to segment them, how do you want to service them? Right, so that would be the that would be the question because otherwise it's a very very massive task and you know uh, to to do right. So that's just my comment on kind of the, uh, the data sanitization slash uh, LLM training. Um, my my question uh, also just looking at your roadmap, right? You're trying to I'm trying to figure out what's the sweet spot of your landing zone. Where do you want your MVP to land? Write me. You know, from simple customer service thing, are you taking these medications and supplements to kind of the answering the more complex questions about, you know, three degrees of separation away from a simple logical, you know, answer to, you know, all of this data combined together now gives you this is the best 
you know, advice, right? Where it's not obvious and clear to me where you are trying to be, where's the sweetest part of your audience? And, you know, like you, like, like you recognize from this forum, we can say patient lab. I mean, we have our needs. We have been talking about chatbot needs and stuff like that. Our needs are probably a lot more complex on what we want to be able to do. You know, we, as an example, you know, we have continuous influx of new patients who will come in, but they don't know what the historic conversations have been. How do you summarize and give them the historic conversation when they ask? They ask the question so that they have a good starting point rather than everybody answering, right? So, so the needs can be very, very different. And I'm just curious as to if you have segmented the market to say, this is the sweet spot of what you want to service and serve. And and that because that's where the biggest need is in, in your mind. So if you can help understand that. Sure. So uh, first of all, for our MVP, um, uh, Brad, can I still share my screen? Yes. Let me know if you can see. Uh, yeah, we can see. Yeah, so this is kind of uh, a more holistic picture of uh, Carebot. So, but as, as you know, we're still developing MVP. We're gonna need users' inputs to help uh, guide us to where we want when it comes to the information part. So our MVP is gonna be more like the chatbot too. So we need users feedbacks in order for us to really know which direction is the right direction. Um, to answer your question about how we segment the, consumer, co the consumer's patients, because when it comes to um, even just information, there are so many different areas you can touch. People with more advanced uh, uh, cancer, they probably, who ha already have cancer for years, they're gonna ask very different questions from who are just newly diagnosed. And also patients maybe already reached remission, they just gonna utilize it as a tool to do the maintenance. These are kind of like are the three main buckets we're gonna segregate, but in terms of MVP, for now, we are not, um, we're more targeting the first two. We're not, but we're, but we're not separating the, the first two, which are the advanced and the newly diagnosed. But these two are gonna be our targeted uh, users. <clears throat> Just answer that question. Isn't that a lot to work with? Because <laughs> like you said, the needs are, needs are somewhat different in, the, in those spaces. Uh, it is, and uh, right now we are uh, still building the MVP, still trained it, and um, feeding to feed, feed it with different information just to see the answers. I think later on we wanted to um, involve oncologists to evaluate the answers, to score those answers. Just, I think high level lay, it could target a lot of users because the baseline model is GPT-4. But as you mentioned, there are also a lot of uh, mis misinformation probably within the information it provides. Um, this part we're still testing. We want to see how, how, how well, how good the answer is. If the answer is actually at high level, it's pretty directional, it's good enough. They want, we definitely want to target more users. But if the answer is still a little bit hallucinating, misleading information, then we're gonna narrow it down to just a part of cancer patient. Maybe we're gonna focus on um, lung cancer, who's actually the majority of the, um, uh, the cancer se sector. We're gonna start from lung cancer patients and start with patients with more advanced 
to do this. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thanks. Are there any more questions or comments? Uh, Vanessa, do you what have any doing other? This awesome. Oh. Yeah. It's, it's Go ahead. definitely the wave of the future. Um, you've got some big hurdles. Um, several of us have worked in this space before and uh, some big challenges, but I really like what you're doing. You know, you're you're layering on, you know, tools that I didn't have five years ago. So I, I tried to do a similar thing at Human Longevity. Just didn't have those tools and uh, way to go. Uh, I think um, your MVP is um, good and you're going to learn a lot when you actually try to help individual patients such as us. So everyone here has got different data, different trajectories. It's, it's a lot to uh, uh, basically in, ingest our data from the mass of data. But I am a big fan and uh, it sounds like you have some good good pals here that have got some great insights. Um, I would leverage that. So uh, way to go. So Vanessa, you'll want to follow up after this session with that's Rick Stanton. He's a co-founder of Cancer Patient Lab. He's a bioinformatician by background, so he can go deep, deep, deep on microbiology um, and understands all of the technical aspects of the, the medical technical microbiology aspects of, of treatments and options and so on. Um, and then uh, I, Amit Gatani, who was speaking before, is it, you know, by background as a tech product manager, uh, tech business executive. So really understands everything from marketing to business. You heard his questions. He's really, you know, could mm -hmm. understand business model. He can understand strategy um, and all the operations. So, uh, and Amit's based in the Sacramento area and uh, Rick's based in the, I call it the Amgen catchment zone <laughs> <laughs> near near uh, near la yep. yeah go walk in the so, dog meet a bunch of amgen yeah. people in the park so you know so if nothing else you you've you know you've you've the, hopefully this session has given you uh some be the people that showed up are interested in, in helping you and they all have expertise that i think can help you and and as you go forward um eric has his hand up one more question yeah, hey Vanessa. Um, so you talked a lot here about MVP and still working on developing your MVP, as you said. I guess I was just trying to get a, a little bit better understanding. I'm sure it's an estimate, of course, about like what is what is your timeline? Do you think in terms of like getting to a point where you're actually releasing th this MVP? I, I'm just trying to a little context in my head as to to where you're at in this development cycle of of getting there, right? Uh, just very, uh, be very honest. So we're now we are bootstrapping and we have only one developer uh, who's actually we have one fractional CTO who's also a developer uh, working on the backend. And then we have one engineer um, doing the chatbot piece. And our timeline is we're aiming to release MVP uh, in early March. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. With all the all the tests done by oncologists by that part by that time. So so far the real the developing piece is actually gonna it's very quick. We are almost uh, halfway, but we already saw a lot of issues. And um I wanna basically uh, leave a lot of cushions to get oncologists involved to score those answers. Um, so we're going to do a lot of iteration, um, our uh, corrections before we release MVP. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, that's much sooner than I expected you to say, but that's really cool. 
Um, and I, and I know that like the MVP is just a start when, once you put that out there, you, that's when you really get the feedback and that's where you can really take off from. Right. So cool. Thanks. Of course. I want to say early March is definitely, uh, a very optimistic, uh, view. Yeah. May, um, because we, we haven't really got the feedback from our colleges. <laughs> Well, keep going. Uh, it's awesome. Thanks. Vanessa, I know you want to put out a request just to put it in the, the, the meeting notes and so on to people to contact you and maybe put out a, a place where they can contact you, an email address or something. Um, and and then this is, you get the final word. Any other, you know, closing points or questions you want to ask? Uh, yeah, I actually kind of threw out a, uh... Uh, a hardcore question, but I do want to, two questions. I do want to listen to your um, honest opinion. Um, the first one, um, first one is not hardcore at all. Uh, how do you currently learn about the treatments in new clinical trials and to learn about your symptoms? Do you know, use Google? David, go ahead. Yeah, I do a fair amount of ad hoc uh, uh, searching using uh, Google and DuckDuckGo and a couple other uh, search engines. Um, and um, I also do uh, watch the conversations in a couple of Facebook groups. And um, I've actually gotten some interesting leads from uh, things that have popped up in my uh, YouTube feed. Uh, for example, from uh, a urology channel. Uh, so um, serendipitous finds anyway. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, each of those sp you know, spiders out into other questions. Um, but I do a lot more of my uh, uh, searching along those lines. Uh, that's all uh, online. And uh, I find things I want to discuss with my oncologist. And that can lead to other things. Uh, including a couple of books that she recommended to me. Thanks. <clears throat> Eric. Yeah, so Google, of course, <laughs> right? Uh, that's like the first thing, but um, something actually my wife has done, not me, my wife is the researcher of our house. Um, and she said, this is something that uh, it's really good at is she actually uses chat GPT currently um so so take like you know doctor prescribed oh you're gonna do uh, pluvicto for example this is a ca prostate cancer treatment you can plug that in there and and ask it like what are the side effects what's the the, the treatment kind of what does it mean just to quickly get a better understanding of what the heck that treatment means right um so um, it's interesting when you're, t uh, you know, I've had that in the back of my head as you're talking about your, your product here. And, and one of my questions was like, how does it differ from just putting stuff into chat GPT? I did hear one thing you saying you're looking at like cancer patient lab, uh, uh, data also. Um, so anyways, that's my answer to your question. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I have one thing. Oh, I heard, Sorry. I heard. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I wanted to add one thing, and that is when I first got started with all of this, um, I expected to find some resources and leads uh, through uh, the uh, medical organization, my oncologist's uh, um, uh, uh, hospital, uh, and their website. And I was really disappointed at how little I found that was either helpful or enticing at all to f pursue at all. So back to one of the earlier points in this discussion, it was over a year before it even occurred to me, maybe I should go see if there's some support groups on online um, because what was available in person in my general area was much too far away and much too troubled to, to get to. Thank you so much. Jeff, Jeff Dwyer. Oh, you're on mute, Jeff. Hello, Vanessa. The question that, that you were asked about um, 
where do you go when you first uh, are diagnosed for information? Um, I quickly thought about that. And basically where I have gotten all my information is not really through general search, but through signing up for um, patient advocacy sites through, for, for example, mail care, um, for the various sites at mail care or on Inspire or uh, patients like me. Um, that was where I first went. And you encounter a lot of scams, as you mentioned. They come from everywhere. But you then you dig down, uh, you reach out. So I have developed my own network um, through the private chat on patient advocacy to digging down and getting an email address, a phone number. So I probably have two, three dozen patients like me that are on similar profiles. They're Gleason 910. They've had a prostatectomy. Then now they're at their radiation point. Okay, how are you gonna pick that? Okay, well, have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of that? Um, it's a lot of personalized interaction with men from around the world. I mean, I'm talking to people um, in, in Australia, in England, in Canada, um, through direct email, some with phone calls. I'm talking with a man in Thailand over the phone. Um, that's how he prefers to talk. Um, and I'm finding, um, well, how did you make that decision? Well, have you seen this um, paper? Uh, no. Uh, you know, so you don't find that stuff on Google. You don't find it there because it's not there. You have to dig it out of patient portals and then dig it out of the patients that are taking the time to basically post and get in arguments. And basically some get banned. I got banned from one because I was asking questions and I realized I'm getting banned from this particular portal because they're sponsored by competitors of what I'm saying. For instance, I'm asking about <clears throat> drugs that um, used to be used for prostate cancer but now they're not being used because they're pushing the one that goes from that pharmaceutical company. So it is wild, wild west out there. And, um, but that's where I've gotten as far as I've gotten, um, which isn't very far. I mean, I've had a prostatectomy and I've had radiation therapy, but I had it through um, proton beam. And let me tell you, trying to get proton beam service in New England is a bitch. You cannot get it. You have to leave the area. And it's a competitive reason. So that's where I get my stuff. But it's not through um, it's not through a lot of the traditional things. I eventually get to the medical papers and then I get to the doctors. But it's it's a hunt and, and um, I don't know how you're gonna standardize that. I really don't. But um, you asked, so I thought I'd supply it. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, Jeff's oh, really uh, unusual uh, in that he, just sorry, quickly, Amit, he is um, a researcher. Uh, yeah, his background is in literature, actually, but he goes and he finds an article that's interesting. He finds a principal investigator, and then he reaches out to the principal investigator and says, can I talk to you? So he's amazing in that regard. He's very unusual, but but uh, that's 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 what like a super activated patient looks like. Um, I interrupted you, Amit. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna you know support what uh, Jeff said as well as David said, right? I mean, none of us have time. To your point, right? Do we want to enjoy a cup of coffee with our spouse, or you know, just keep researching? None of us have time to just you know keep our head in sand all the time with this stuff. So uh, the way I look at it is you have to multi-source and crowdsource the problem. And multi-sourcing and crowdsourcing is basically, you know, joining some of these groups, listening into them for the topics that are relevant to you, reach out to those individuals for more one-on-one -on -one conversations like Jeff was saying, and, and then take it from there. If you're looking for something very really basic, you can go to the clinicaltrial.gov, but, you know, we are in the stage where, you know, we are three layers of separation away from basic and it requires real experience discussion 
and you just have to listen to multiple groups and and then give back to them because again if you have learned something give back to them because others will benefit from that so uh, again there 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 may be you know there may be sponsored groups there may be things which people call a scam but i generally think that people are doing this in good faith in general if there is no commercial big commercial sponsorship align people because people are patients they they know they have to build trust for them to trust others so generally you know moderators do a good, good job of kind of hey if uh, if somebody is getting out of the line then they will help navigate that but a good part of it is just multi sourcing and cloud sourcing your problem so Makes sense. Okay, we're running past the hour. Vanessa, is that okay with you? All right, do you have a few more minutes? Uh, I do have a few more minutes, uh, but I uh, I respect people's time. If yeah, if it's okay with all of you to just maybe go over a few minutes. Okay, let's keep going for a few minutes. Rick and then David. Rick. Yeah, I'm uh, increasingly getting my next therapy option from my oncologist. As you move along, uh, through you've already done this, you've already failed that. Uh, so, um, just to, as a quick answer to your question, um, my oncologist is at UCLA. He's got uh, a fair view of clinical trials and treatments. And so, I am uh, currently just kind of not doing a lot of research because I'm on a clinical trial that seems to be working. Um, but that will change as, um, you know, I start losing efficacy on that uh, clinical trial, then I'm going to be looking more. So it's kind of like a, I'm taking a break from looking because I can, I feel, and I need a break. And then uh, as I need to make, find my next parachute, then it'll, you know, uh, your services will be more valuable to me. So I see this slinky timeline where, hey, okay, I'm cool for a few months. And then, oh, I'm not. Uh, better talk to Vanessa. <laughs> so, yeah. We find that generally that the pattern is that people are looking at their next line of therapy, then they're very engaged. And when they're in remission and things are stable, then they're not. So you, your persona of the user is going to be kind of filtering in and out depending on their their situation. Uh, David, you're next. Yeah, One of the problems I think you're going to come up against, and I don't have any recommendations on how to solve it, is when I'm doing my own searching and reading and referencing and uh, exploring, and I come across opinions, uh, I'm always looking for the references. I'm always looking for the citations. So if I were to be using some sort of uh, chat AI uh, tool, um, I would be wondering, okay, you just delivered this block of text giving me an opinion or advice. Uh, why do you think so? What are the references? And I don't know how to present that, but it would be something that I would very much like to be able to follow. Yes. Yeah, which is also a solution for hallucinating and uh, making stuff up, the misinformation, right? Yes. And also, uh, yeah, so we also thought about it. And uh, one thing we'd like to do is definitely pre, um, uh, show the link to the resource in the conversation. And this actually also um, can help us to by, by not really giving a lot of detailed advice from mm -hmm. at our end. We can, we want to be the, the bridge, not the provider, you know, like we want to bridge users and the credible uh, resources. Okay, Bob Cha, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'll keep this really quick, Vanessa. Maybe we talked about it. So I've uh, gone to oncologists at Stanford and El Camino very recently with two very new patients who are very close to me. And the way they know about their treatments is they get diagnosed, biopsied, 
and then the doctor immediately asks you questions from Epic software and sticks you in a silo. That's about all they do. It's highly transactional. And it's going to be hard to get cut through to the patient through, you know, the siloing of patients, if I may say so. Um, any comments will be nice. Thanks. Okay. Um, and then my quick answer on um, the way other, in addition to everything everyone said, so yes to all of that. And um, I also subscribe to a number of newsletters. <clears throat> And a lot of those are announcing when new, you know, when new treatments are coming online or becoming available or being approved. And then the other I, I must plug is Cancer Commons. Uh, Cancer Commons um, provides free second opinions. And as I'm approaching my next line of treatment for my lymphoma, uh, Emma Stibbelman at Cancer Commons has been an angel. She is just friggin' amazing. She's down in the guts of understanding the disease three times, 10 times better than I ever could and advising on clinical trials that I should be considering and prioritizing amongst all the treatment options that I'm looking at. So she's doing what my oncologist would be doing, but it's so valuable to have that kind of resource so that I'm now fully armed and you know prepared to go have the conversation with my oncologist for the ultimate decision, but I've already been through the whole decision process with everything from Cancer Commons. I see. Um, may I ask, uh... The information provided or the the services provided by cancer commons are they like free or are they paid service free i'm i'm also using massive bio which is another member of the cancer patient lab preferred community um, they provide free guidance on clinical trials um, and then there's another service that we use called cure match and they take biomarkers and then give uh, suggestions for drug combinations. All of these are, uh, you know, information that I can uh, assemble and then take to my oncologist. And, and Rick's been through the same process and Brian as well. Jeff, you have one, <clears throat> you know, Jeff, you have one more comment? You're on mute. Oh, I just wanted to comment to Bob Shaw. You're absolutely right where you um, are guiding um, people that come to you. And this has happened to me over the past four years. Um, Jeff, I hear you've got uh, prostate cancer. I got just diagnosed. So you ask a half a dozen questions and you find out that I, I come to the discussion with somebody new that they get, they're so curious and so frightened that they get dumped in the room with a urologist. If they're lucky, they've gone to a center of excellence, but they're still gonna to come to a time where they're in the, they've gone through the, what is called the uh, cancer diagnosis and they get sat in there and say, in comes the urologist and he says, I'm trained in surgery. So I'm, I'm here to tell you that um, I would do surgery. The next guy coming in, could be selling you a Chevrolet or a Ford, but he's selling you radiology. So he's giving you the term there. The next guy is the oncologist and I can put you in remission with these hormone drugs. Um, and you walk out of there wondering how many books can you read between now and when I have to make this decision. Um, and it drives you crazy because there's that it, it seems like the colleagues at the facility, whether it be a small rural hospital or one of the big centers of excellence are all in competition with each other for their trained specialty. And when you get really cynical about it, their cash flow. And you come out going, Jesus, um, who can I really turn to? Um, and that sent me to the patient portals because I had to ask people, hey, I was just presented with this and what bounces back is a dozen um, anonymous feeds saying, don't do that. You'll, you know, you'll be toast. You'll be have a burnt anus the rest of your life if you do it that way. So, I mean, it's, it's frightening. It's frightening. Yeah. And if you just are one of those guys that I see in the waiting room all the time, watching the wall TV, just doing whatever they were told, 
it scares the hell out of me and I feel sorry for them because they're on a they're on a path through a silo like you say without having any idea what else is out there that's the way I think about it and uh, of course I run up against that all the time and uh, and I understand Rick what you've you you finally got a oncologist that you trust I am not there yet um, I trust them but I think that their bias is so um, tied to standard of care, uh, malpractice uh, care, colleagues, um, proven clinical trials that you just don't know. You just don't know. So, uh, you know, I'm probably the worst guy to be talking to anybody who's just been diagnosed with it because um, after they leave me, um, I never either, I never hear from them again. And, and I, when I run into them, they say, oh, I stayed with my local urologist in Podunk, USA, and this is where I am. And I say, well, good for you. I'm glad. Good for you. I just can't do that. So that's where I am. So that's my story. All right. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of time and respecting everyone, Vanessa, again, kind of the final word here, maybe? Uh, yes. Um, I didn't get a chance to throw out the hard question, but I think uh, after the meeting, I'm going to post uh, um, two links in our uh, discussion board or the, the community board. One is a link to our user survey. If you can please um, spend a few minutes to fill out the user survey, it's, it's going to be very, very uh, helpful for us. Uh, it has some questions uh, related to your past experience, um, how you think about uh, patient-centric app. Um, yeah, if you can fill out the survey, it will be a big help for us. And another link is, uh, um, it's not a link, it's another, basically, I'm going to connect you with our um, UI UX person, Elaine. Um, we need another five or six volunteers um, to help us uh, fine tune our prototype. Um, Brad already uh, did one yesterday and we're looking for another kind of like five, hopefully six um, people can, can, can do the user testing. It will be about like 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Okay. And I also leave my, uh, contact information um, and hopefully I, I'm really hoping to have more um, like further conversations with with you. I think in 